when we hear the separation of powers, we tend to think of the United States system of government. We think of the president, who's the commander in chief and personification of executive power. Uh, we think of the Congress, the legislators whose pens bring in the laws. We think of the Supreme Court, the mouths that pronounce the words of the law. According to the doctrine of Madison and Montesquieu, by separating the branches of government, no single individual or party can control the entire machinery of government. No Hitler or Mussolini could ever come to power without first dismantling the separation of powers. And yet, of course, that's exactly what they did. All around the world, presidents have closed Congress, suspended constitutions, and invoked war measures. They've used the pretext of terrorism to circumvent the rule of law. So do constitutions really matter? They do, but to understand why, we need to uncover the key to their success, which lies in ancient history. Constitutions first emerged with the spread of reading and writing. Once laws could be written down, it was possible to coordinate collective action on a vast scale and over long time periods. The ancient Egyptians created courts that developed legal systems that resolved conflicts and made extensive commerce possible. At first, only the literate benefited. But over time, as literacy spread, laws became the source of the power of the people. And as more people learned to read and write, critical analysis of constitutions and laws flourished. Writing in the fourth century BC, Aristotle analyzed over 140 constitutions from the Hellenic world, and he made a remarkable discovery. All constitutions contained deliberative, legislative, and judicial elements. That was the first major watershed in the invention of the separation of powers. The idea of law as a reflection of popular sovereignty flourished under Republican Rome. But as Rome expanded and became an empire and later fell under the control of the Christian church, the idea of law as holy writ gained ground. At that point, constitutionalism entered the Dark Ages. And it wasn't until the Renaissance that the second major watershed event occurred. The invention of the Gutenberg Press led to another major expansion of reading and writing. And with it came both religious conflict the separation of church and state, and parliamentary democracy. Legislatures became organs of public opinion. Conditions were ripe for Montesquieu's canonical doctrine. If you want liberty, you must separate the branches of government. Madison paraphrased Montesquieu's thesis that power must be made to check power, saying ambition must be made to counteract ambition. Both stressed the need to limit state power. But as we see in the separation of powers also enables states to use texts to organize political life in accordance with the law. Constitutions constrain each branch in order to ensure that together they generate the collective capacity to act in accordance with the general interests of the public. When the branches of government don't work together, the collective capacity of the state is diminished. This is especially important to keep in mind today because we're living through a third major watershed in social communication the rise of electronic media. This change shifts the balance in favor of oral communication and executive power at the expense of legislatures and courts. The telegraph, the wireless radio, the telephone, motion pictures, and then television and the internet have led to a further explosion of possibilities for communication, now instantaneous and spanning the planet. With these changes have come new forms of bureaucratic state power, including totalitarianism, new technologies of surveillance and control, subtle forms of propaganda and persuasion, nuclear weapons and virtual wars. New technologies of power can undermine the separation of powers. Let's take an example. President Obama's use of drone warfare raises serious questions about the separation of powers. Some argue that the separation of powers demands that the president use his war-making uh, authority without interference from other branches of government. But I would argue exactly the reverse. The separation of powers demands the involvement of other branches of government. By conducting what are, in effect, extrajudicial executions, Obama has circumvented the constitutional right to due process. By denying judicial review, he has displaced judicial power from the courts to the presidency. And by deciding what enemies, in which geographical spaces or battlefields, and in what moments of time fall under his authority to conduct war, Obama has made himself a supreme legislator. The president can and has issued secret commands to kill US citizens and non-citizens with no trial or possibility of appeal. For drone warfare to be constitutional, the legislature needs to be actively involved in determining the scope, the nature, and the timetable of the war on terror 
and it must be remedied for victims when presidential powers are abused. Otherwise, the power to dispose of lives resides not in the law, but in the character of a leader. Such power might seem to make a leader strong, but it makes the political system weak. It fuels the very violence it's intended to prevent and turns the state into an instrument of terror, and it places the office of the presidency above the Constitution itself. This weakens the overall capacity of the political system to generate legitimate authority, to resolve conflicts, and to tap into the willingness of the public to act collectively. So in summary, I've argued that the separation of powers is not just about dividing the branches of government so that no one branch can dominate or control the others. It's about generating political power by coordinating the branches of government around the use of text, solving the problems that are inherent in how we use text to coordinate collective action, problems such as what does a text mean, and how should it be applied in a particular case. States that have the ability to deliberate before acting, to act lawfully, and to assess the consequences of their actions are states that have strong constitutions.